Hello, and welcome back to theCUBE, broadcasting live from RSAC here in San Francisco. I'm here with my colleague Dave Vellante, David Linthicum, and the team here at theCUBE. And today, we are joined by Mark McLean, the CEO, founder and CEO of SailPoint. Mark, welcome, it's great Thank to have you. It's a great pleasure to be here, thanks so much. We are so glad that you made time for us, and you know, identity management, it is a thorny thing. <laughs> and we have had lots of conversations over the course of the last three days about identity management. And really I know that you are, you know, at SailPoint, you're kind of on the record as saying the identity management ecosystem, the way that we do it needs to evolve. It needs to grow up. So share with us a little bit your thinking on that, would you? Absolutely, yeah. I guess I have uh, the pleasure of being an OG in the space, as they say. So I was here before we even coined the term identity management for the space. So <laughs> been around this for a bit. Um, what we typically mean by that is, when we started into this market space 20 plus years ago, it was very much constrained in most people's minds to the employees of the organization. Those were the identities people were mostly talking about. And it was mostly about, I'd like to ensure those people actually have access to the right stuff. Ideally, and there was an operational side to that, which today goes by life cycle, it used to be called provisioning, but mostly life cycle management now. And then post Enron, SOX, we sort of got into this whole compliance and certification game. We should audit and validate, right? So first we should try to, kind of like finances, right? We should try to operate well, and then somebody should look over and make sure we did it the right way. That was the kind of the core. Um, you know, other aspects of identity market space certainly include um, single sign-on and multi-factor, which is a very you know, well-known discipline now and becoming pretty universal, frankly. Right. I, I think if you're signing into 50 apps at your shop, you should yell at your CIO. That should not be happening today. <laughs> you know, SSO and multi-factor, pretty common. And then kind of the other historically interesting space has been privilege, right? Like yep. understanding the, the, the power and therefore somewhat the danger of those privileged users and making sure that they are who that we think they are, they're doing what we expect them to be doing, because if they're not, really bad things can happen really fast, right? Well, if they have the access that they need, not the access to everything. That's and right, that's and, really and importantly in that space, even if they have the access they're supposed to, they're actually doing what you expect them to be doing. Yeah. It's when you know the proverbial disgruntled DBA says, you fire me, I'm going to wipe out the corporate database. <laughs> Those are bad days, right? So that's, that's kind of the history. Why we talk about it being different, so much has changed relatively recently. I'd say some of the key dynamics here are the move to cloud and sort of perimeterless environments, right? Um, I don't know that perimeters are dead, that's not a fair statement. It's just clear they're insufficient. <laughs> I don't think yeah. we're going to quit having firewalls, but everybody has figured out, I can't count on the firewall to protect my enterprise. So we've got kind of this open, zero trust mindset of everybody's kind of connecting and I kind of want to make sure you're who you, I think you are and you're doing what I expect, yeah. right? But the other big dynamics are happening is what we defined as an identity has rapidly evolved from your employees to the other humans that are connected to your stuff, call that supply chain, distribution chain, business partners, to very interestingly now non-humans, right? What does it mean to have all these robotic software bots and processes and AI generated and IOT, like I could, I could go alphabet soup on us, right? But I won't, but I mean there's a sense of all these new kinds of identities are dramatically increasing the complexity and scale on the identity side. But the other side is going through a similar thing, which is historically, what we really meant was, I want to know what David does and, and which applications can he access and what can he do inside SAP or Workday or Oracle, right? Now, we all hear the stats, right? That data that lives in those structured business apps, whether you purchase them or they're homegrown, all that data is getting exported and downloaded all day, every day, shared, <laughs> put into multiple spreadsheets, shipped around the internet, and the idea now that you've protected your enterprise by locking down who can access your financial application and you don't know where all that data lives in SharePoint, you're, you're kidding yourself. <laughs> so, the explosion of identities, the explosion of data, and SailPoint sits at that critical intersection of, do you know who all your identities are, what they are, <laughs> and do you know all the data you want to protect and have access to, and, and understanding that complexity and managing to risk on that is very challenging. So a couple years ago, it's probably a few years ago now, because I think it was pretty much in the middle of the pandemic, there yep. was this big conversation about converging privilege yep. and identity, and we heard a lot of noise about that. Right. And uh, I'm fascinated by your point of view on, on convergence versus or what you say, unification. unification. Hel right. Help us understand what so you one of those, mean yeah. by that. Is it a distinction without a difference? We think it is a difference. Let's talk about that a second. So, 
and term, these terms are not necessarily self-explanatory, but I think the way people are using the term today, convergence means you've got a vendor doing one of these, you've got a vendor doing this, you've got a vendor doing that, and I can <laughs> kind of jokingly tell you that every investment banker in the planet visited some combination of me and the Ping guys <laughs> and the CyberArt guys or <laughs> Delinea or Beyond Trust and said, hey, I got this great idea. Why don't we put you guys together? <laughs> what a fantastic idea, no one said Why that. Why didn't we think of that? Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> and so there was this kind of, especially by the way in response to Microsoft talking about going sure. broadly, and oh, not so far back, but a little ways back now, Okta, who was sort of viewed as the, the, the kind of default winner of the identity game, which some of us did not appreciate that positioning in the market, but anyways, they were dominating that next generation of access, single sign on MFA, and everybody just assumed, well, they're just going to ripple into these other spaces and own them. And what folks like me and Udi over at, over at CyberArk and the guys at Delinea Art and others, like we went, ah, oh, I don't think people understand how hard this is and how different it is from that. <laughs> Because to, a, to an investor or a fairly simple observer, it's all identity, must all be related, pr probably be better, it's consolidation, convergence, right? What we said was no, the, the issue is what you really need is a unified single platform, single data model, single set of workflows, single set of policies, and you apply that in all those different areas. The one that we've, the most counter uh, intuitive thing we've said is, we're not going to get into that SSO MFA game. Why? <laughs> to be a little harsh, because we think Microsoft's going to dominate it ultimately. I think it's just going to be clear to the world that in the enterprise segment, which we serve, if you go down market, I think Google's making a lot more inroads there, but mm -hmm. in the enterprise segment, Microsoft owns that office environment, that, that office suite, the, the productivity suite, whatever you want to call it. It's just quite logical that you would think as a user, I'm going to sign in to that environment and yeah. it'll get me to everything else I care about. It turns out that's not so much a security issue as a convenience issue, yes. right? It's more secure than yellow sticky on your computer with all your passwords. <laughs> it's definitely better than that. But does it really help Microsoft understand that environment and all the security and risk profile of all those apps that they don't own? All the other business apps, all the other homegrown apps, they don't, they don't know those apps, they don't understand that. That's what we have developed over many years, a couple of decades now, <laughs> the very difficult task of going into all these enterprises. We have 20,000 different connectors to bespoke applications now in our library because everybody's got something different and you got to connect to all of it, pull that data in, map it, <laughs> and explain it to people. So, long-winded answer to convergence says, let me grab these three business apps, identity apps, put them together, and I'll sell them to you as one thing. Right, procurement people love that. Yeah, of course. Tactical people don't always love that. And I love the stat, Dave, we were just looking at before we went on air, that, that, that folks here at the conference are saying they expect to expand the number of security vendors next year. Why? Because all this stuff is very specialized in many cases, and it turns out what we do is quite specialized in difference than what Okta has historically done, or Ping, or than what Cyber and others have done. We do think, and we, we made a little noise about this, that the next generation of privilege might be a little closer. What I mean by next generation is far more dynamic. Where I, the idea that privilege historically was you're a database administrator or a system admin, I got to lock you down and track what you do, right? Now it's like, hey, you're just a normal help desk person, but you need to reset a password. Turns out that takes extremely high rights to do that. Yeah. You don't really want that 22 year old on your help desk to have extremely high rights to the whole AD system. Why don't you just say, reset a password, he knows what's supposed to happen there, he or she, but off it goes, temporarily creates privilege, makes the change, comes back, that person never had permanent privilege. And then that goes away. That yeah. goes away. That's a whole new way to think about privilege, which we think is far more relevant to the way we think of this identity integrated control plane. So, kind of a long-winded answer, I apologize, but that's, that's why we say unification around the core of securing your enterprise through the lens of identity is different than rolling up three categories. It's present what you said about Microsoft, you mm. know, the data we were showing you before. Mm. If you look at Microsoft, and, and they're just ubiquitous, mm -hmm. in that those charts we were showing you before, yeah. out of the 1800 accounts, yes. they're in 1700. Of course, and they're they just everywhere. completely dominate the graph. You can't even look at anybody else, they're off, <laughs> up and to the right. And so to the, to the point, they, they're, they're every, why would you want to compete against that? You know, it's the convenience factor. Yeah. And the procurement says, okay, great. 
cheap, easy, yeah. you know, good enough, great. Totally. We'll take out it. of our space, that's why I think our friends at Zoom are going to have a struggle against Teams, right? Like you're like, it's just kind of built into the Microsoft yeah. environment, why don't I just do that, right? But you remember what happened to the cyber stocks when Microsoft had their big announcement? Yes. You know, they all dropped, I don't know if you were a public company at the time, you, you might have been, yep. I'm sure you got, you got hit on sympathy, uh -huh. right? And, yep. and the market was just wrong yeah. about that. They didn't understand the nuance that you just described. I mean, you can't not respect this incredible resurgent Microsoft under yeah. Nadella. It's an right. amazing, yeah. one of the greatest business stories of my lifetime, no doubt, right? But there's also this kind of other edge of the spectrum, like just because Microsoft says there's going to do something, you shouldn't necessarily roll up your tent and go home, right? right. That, they're an amazing company. We're pretty confident we have more people working on this problem than Microsoft does. They are a very big company. They're not all working on this, <laughs> right? No, they got that whole Xbox thing and you know, a few other things going on. So, at the end of the day, sometimes people can get caught up in the how can you compete with the giant. Well, 20 years ago when we started, we were competing with Oracle and IBM. And, you know, they were the giants of 20 years ago. We're good. It's like <laughs> we, Bill we know Joy's, how to compete with those guys. Yeah, Bill Joy's law, yes, right? No, yes. No matter how good your people are, there's a lot of people out there that collectively are better. So, exactly. You know, so. Exactly. Well, and I think Microsoft isn't exactly going to, you know, nothing against Microsoft, and they've done an amazing job. Yep. But they're not really known for their amazing security chops. Right. And a lot of the feedback that I'm hearing in the market is, you know, so sure, you're going to charge us, you know, per seat for mm -hmm. the co-pilot access, and then you're going to charge us, you know, oh sure, we can fulfill your security needs, and we'll charge you $30 right. a seat for that, and so it's, you know, people are saying, wait a minute, you know, I'm feeling sort of yes. um, price creep there a little bit. That, so. and I'll tell you the other thing I think we are hearing regularly, and I, should, I assume it's come up in some of your dialogue, what's the newest term that you probably didn't hear three years ago? Multi-cloud. Yeah. Every company who said, I'm an Amazon shop, I'm an Azure shop, now what they're all saying is, I'm multi-cloud. Yeah. Why? Because old guys in tech like me will tell you, customers hate when one vendor has apparent dominance of yeah. a market space. They know that's going to cause innovation to slow and prices to go up. And so now all these big enterprise customers are like, we got all these things. And then I pause there and I look at people and go, so you think you're going to want that, CI that CIO is going to want Microsoft to manage Google and Amazon for them? Really? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. So can you create an abstraction layer mm. that I'll say floats above those clouds uh, and creates a, a common experience ac across them. I presume that's IP yeah. that, that you have. Yeah. Um, and, and where are you at in the maturity of that? I mean, that's we've customer. been, no offense, that's yeah. what we've been doing for 20 years. Yeah. It just wasn't against cloud, it was against every ERP system, every okay. directory, every business it application. It was probably harder, actually. You know, it's actually, the to your point, it's getting a little simpler the more we see the consolidation at the hyperscalers, right. right? But yeah, I mean, that's what we've done for years is say we are the independent layer that focuses on the identity and you tell us by policy what all that identity should have access to and not just access as in sign in, back to where we were a minute ago, what privileges and permissions can that person do in that system? It's one thing to say, I can let you have Salesforce access. It's another to say, you can see the accounts in your territory or you can see the entire right. pipeline, right? Right. You don't want the rep in Atlanta having access to the entire pipeline. So there's, there's two levels or three levels of permissions in many cases here that we're really dealing with. And, and that's the nuance that is very difficult to manage at scale. That's what SailPoint excels at. Are passwords ever going to go away? We're going to try. I mean, we're not fans of passwords. That's not really the part of the business we're in. <laughs> You're not hanging yeah. on to that. We like to say, that's the other thing people yeah. say, why aren't you going to get into like when Duo was for sale and showed yeah, up yeah, at, right. at uh, Cisco. Great company, by the way. But like, we're like, look, we're ambivalent to that act, that's the authentication. How do you, how do you validate you're really Dave and a multi-factor is an extra way to do that, password's the basic. At the end of the day we're like, yeah, somebody's going to authenticate you, we care about once we think you know who you are, what can you access? And, and to your point, if this changes to a, to a passwordless sync or a you know, pass key, I guess it's the new hottest thing going, right, Wh whatever it is, Somebody's going to get you authenticated, that's actually not the part of the game we're in. Yep. Once I know who you are, what can you have access to? That's so the passwordless hard really doesn't change doesn't the game change us for you. at all. Mm -mm. It doesn't okay. affect us. Your value really. prop remains 100% intact. Independent of that. Right? Uh, exactly. Behind that, yeah. yeah lot, this is where people get kind of confused in the nuances of identity. Like, yeah. oh, if that happens, aren't you guys in trouble? Nope. <laughs> that actually doesn't affect <laughs> us at all. we built this thing the right way. They, we thought about <laughs> the problem from a different vantage point, and I think it's turning out to have been a very healthy way to think. So we're, we're very happy with that.
Love to get your perspective, because you've been on both sides. Yeah. Private, public, private. Um, I, I didn't to know Mike. which two sides talk, we were talking about there talk, for a second. I don't know where you're going. Talk, <laughs> talk, yeah. talk to Michael Dell about this all the time. Oh, uh, yeah. Private, I don't want to be in the 90-day the, yeah. the he, he, shot he, clock. He did an amazing job. Now he's saying, I love the 90-day shot clock. You yeah, it's great. I get, I was now that I got a team on the floor and, and, I, a, and a, yeah, exactly. And I have all this liquidity and I can uh -huh. do share buybacks and dividends and it's beautiful. It's and, um, unbelievably well sure So. What are your thoughts on public? There's a lot of discussion today about staying private for longer. You know, I guess that's part of the theme. You know, yeah. the market's really maybe not right for, for IPOs. Right. Uh, but we've seen this before. It goes in cycle. We saw this with Cloudera. Yep. They stayed private. I felt like they stayed private too long. You know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe they had other, other business challenges. But yeah. do you have a point of view on that? You know, I think for the most part, you know, obviously we're a private company, so at this point I can't comment on what our timeline or future might look like, right? right? That said, I can comment kind of generally on that question, okay? What I would say is, if, if people in my chair are doing their job right, 99.9% .9 of the company is not affected by that, right? Like, there's a very tiny group of people whose lives are dramatic, dramatically different when you're private versus public. You got SEC reporting, you got accounting guidelines, all that stuff, but at the end of the day, We've got to, you know, market well, create demand, sell well, fulfill that demand, service well, deliver value to customers, lather, rinse, repeat. <laughs> and, and the people that do that across the business, if we were to go public again someday and they have a liquid stock, that will be good. They now have, you know, privately held stock that they believe someday would have some value. I, you know, having come from the startup world where everybody had private stock that they counted on having value someday, that's very comfortable for me and our leadership team. Yeah. So I think, I think it can be overblown as to which side of that line you're on. There are, to Michael Dell's example there, there are certainly things about raising liquidity and, and having extra assets to go after acquisitions and things like that, but on my mind, Having lived through, you know, we're an odd company, right? We, we were venture backed, then PE backed, then public, widely held, now private again, with the same PE firm, highly unusual, and we'll see what happens next. But that said, having been the, the fortunate guy to sit in this chair the whole time, I, it, now I've seen all those playbooks, the bulk of the company really isn't affected by that. So, so Michael, by the way, didn't say to me, now he loves that liquidity, that's sort of my observation, but what he did yeah. share with me was <laughs> it would have been very hard for him to affect that transformation as a public company. Right. And number one, number two, he, it was zero interest rates. <laughs> and his timing was like unbelievable. Yeah. Free so, money but, is great. But you're, you're not going through that kind of painful no. transformation no. Um, that Dell had to go through. I mean, they were getting no. hammered at the time. Right. And so, no, and that's it's look, a different dynamic for it you. It is, and look, I, I am not a financial market professional. I like to kind of refer to Mr. Buffett, who's pretty famous for doing well in that world. And he's, he's a very harsh critic of earnings guidance, quarterly earnings reports. He's like, we're putting companies, you said it, they the 90-day yeah, shot yeah, clock. Right. And, and when you're building a strategic business, like the fact that you're judged every 90 days on yeah. a certain incremental, it, it is constraining and frustrating at times, having lived through that. But it also has the effect of good discipline to drive focus and execution. So I kind of see both the good and the bad of being public from that standpoint, but back to his example, and this is not our story, if you're doing a significant rejiggering of your business, massive transformation, very difficult to do that in the public markets. Well, what about M&A? Because you mm. obviously you can use stock as, yep. as a vehicle to acquire companies, although a lot of, most deals today are all cash, yep. Yep. right? But you can do M&A with yep. PE as well. You, right. you, you just did a recent acquisition, or yep. a small one, yep. you, should, you, should, you should give a plug for Atlas, but, <laughs> but you know, what are your thoughts on that? It's kind of like new PE, new mindset. Yeah, I think, but you sort of answered your own question, I would argue a little, that whichever state you're in, there are assets and resources to go do M&A. If you're a public company with liquid public stock, you're probably going to use that. If you're a private company, but you're healthy and high performing, you're going to have plenty of access to, to funds to go do M&A. So, I think at the end of the day, it's really more about can you do M&A is a function of how, how healthy is your company and who are the people that are funding that business and do they believe in that strategy. If they do, I think no matter which side of that um, line you're on, public or private, you're going to be able to do what you want to do. If you were a capital allocator, wh where would you 
Where would you be in, in, in like this all investing? In on, all in on security. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying within the security space, right? So within oh, security. Oh, within security. Yeah. The question got so much harder now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, Intentionally. Well look, uh, this will sound self-serving, but I'm kind of serious. We do think identity is a particularly attractive subset of the space, undoubtedly. Um, now I don't think that means others are totally unattractive. I think you yeah, got to give credit to the crowd strikes and some of the others that have kind of rethought some of these market spaces and pretty dramatically rebuilt them. Um, you know, the whole, sure, I, I'll give you the uh, Pat uh, buzzword compliant answer, invest in AI. Now, which part of AI and which companies, good luck. Um, I don't know. Okay, so <laughs> would you invest in, uh, let's double click on that, would okay. you invest in AI to, for, to, to make security better, mm. or would you invest in securing AI? Ah, oh, that's a great way of phrasing the question. Um, Hmm. I think today, since I'm a security vendor, I'm also not totally unbiased here, am I? Um, I think using AI to do security better is a, is a double-edged sword that we're going to have to be careful of. Why do I say that? I, one of the funniest terms that's come out in technology in the last few years is AI tools hallucinate. I heard that the first time I went, what? <laughs> what do you mean, technology hallucinate? Are we talking LSD 60 stuff? What are we talking about? <laughs> right, yes is the answer. Um, but there's a sense of, these tools are very early stage. While there's a crazy amount of energy and excitement about AI, we're in the early days here. And if you're a security vendor, right, you don't want to take a lot of risks on how you, in fact, perform security. So putting it all in the hands of an AI tool and just trusting that it's going to give you exactly the right answer is kind of risky, I would argue, at this stage. Will that continue to get better? Absolutely. Are we using AI in aspects? You bet we are. Are we using it for what I'd call the core of how we secure things? Not yet. <laughs> um, because I think it's more like, how do we learn from these technologies and let them accelerate? I love the term augmented intelligence versus artificial intelligence. I think it's going to accelerate and enhance a lot of what we're doing. I don't know we're going to pull people all the way out of a lot of these things very soon. But we'll use less people who will be better informed to do what they're doing, I think will be very common. I have a, a paradox in my brain that I, I would love to. Only uh, one? I'd like to. Uh, <laughs> no. One that I, I just <laughs> thought of <laughs> that I'd love for you to help me resolve. All right, I'm, here's the thing. I feel like I'm playing counselor now, okay? Here's the paradox. Good. I'm a full self driving skeptic. Okay. Okay. But then on the other hand, I'm thinking AGI is actually going to happen. Yeah. Right? And I'm trying to have, a, I'm having trouble rationalize those two things. Where, where do you stand on AGI and <laughs> FSD, if you want to comment? Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> I'm almost tempted to take the fifth and say, look, I don't know that I would consider myself well-educated enough to have a very strong opinion. I think at the end of the day, um, we're just, I come back to the early innings thing, we're so early innings on how these things are unfolding that, you know, I, I gave a talk on this recently. Sorry, I'll veer off, but I'll yeah, try go, to tie it in. Go where you want to. We had this conference in town in Austin um, that's about culture, and we got into culture, and in and, and this case, I was kind of asked to think about how do you see AI affecting culture? It was kind of an interesting question, company culture, right? And I said, well look, the, the advantage of being gray-haired is you've seen some stuff, right? And I'm like, what I've seen multiple times in my career is the promise of new tech gets everybody super excited, they rush to it, and almost inevitably, they miss significant unintended consequences. Let me give you the simple example most of us have lived through, which is ATMs, yeah. <laughs> right? Banks went, ATMs, great, I don't need to pay all those tellers, simplified, I don't need to see you to get your money out, but what accidentally happened? Nobody had any relationship with their bank anymore, so all right. of a sudden your banking choice was super, like, commodity financial driven. Unless Lost you had a, your first party data connection. First party data <laughs> connect, that's what I meant to say, I was going to say that. <laughs> um, but the point right, was, like at the end of the day, like that was an amazing cost saving technology. The unintended consequence was it kind of broke for the retail banks, right? I'm not talking commercial banks and investment yeah. banks, but for the retail banks all of a sudden, that's when they, they overcorrected and turned the bank lobby into a Starbucks. I'm like, I'm not going there to have a coffee. What are you guys doing? That's, that makes sense to me. But there was this sense of like rush to technology, understanding a benefit, a clear benefit of it, without thinking through the secondary effects. And I think you can point to ATMs for that. You can point to email. I remember I was super, I was oh. really dating myself. I was excited about email, because that wasn't a thing when I was. email. I was like, yes, oh, this right. is amazing. This is amazing. Like, oh. Until I had 8,000 <laughs> emails a day, and now I'm not sure it's a good thing, right? <laughs> so there's a sense of, we, we don't Funny. understand the second or even tertiary effects of mm -hmm. technology. Yeah. I think for people that are like, you know, again, all in on, on AI, it's like, yeah, this is an amazing 
breakthrough technology that we're all going to have to figure out how to leverage, but how how fast to adopt it and in what areas to adopt it, just, uh, we jokingly came up with this really helpful phrase, uh, proceed aggressively with caution, <laughs> right? <laughs> what? <laughs> well, that's kind of what we mean, like, kind of proceed aggressively, but with caution. Like, don't just go all in and rush yeah. to do things that you don't understand the full consequence of, but go dig in, find out what we can leverage, figure out how we can get better with what we're doing with technology like AI, but don't, don't just like, we're going to get rid of half our people and give it all to the technology. <laughs> yeah. Nope, nope. Yeah. You know that famous Andy Grove quote, you, you're not recommending that here. Let, let the chaos reign and then rein it in. Yes. No, not here. <laughs> I, I think there's, a, there's that's, uh, to use another great phrase, that's fraught with peril. Yeah. <laughs> fraught with <laughs> peril. <laughs> peril. You know, this is, this is where my, my favorite dadism and one that I've taught Dave Oh, comes I love dadisms. You don't know what you don't know until you know. And that's kind of what you we're talking about. You had a very about. wise father. I, I you do had a wise, have a very, yeah. still have a wise father. But no, I'm lucky, <laughs> yes, I do still have, but, but that's really where yes. we are. We don't know right. what we don't know. Right. And we will know, we're just not there yet. And so your advice makes perfect sense. Yeah, by the way, especially in this area, I joke with like, yeah, we like a lot of folks, we're going to use AI to maybe accelerate the development of content for the website. But we're not like publishing right out of the AI tool to our website. Right. We're going to, you know, accelerate right. the drafting of a content page or something and then say, okay, somebody that really knows what they're doing, somebody make sure that sounds yeah. right or whatever, right? Same with like the early translation tools. If you took your website, ran it through a translation tool and sent it to Japan, you got some very unintended consequences. <laughs> you got immediate feedback. <laughs> immediate feedback. <laughs> Unacceptable. <laughs> not, not what you meant, I think. I don't think that's what you meant. So, so yeah, I think there's, there's a sense of this is way too important a technological shift mm. to not be deeply ingrained in understanding it and figuring out what it means for your space. I loved your question, that was really good. I'm going to take that back and chew on that a minute. <laughs> is it securing AI or AI helping yeah. us secure things? Both are important. Um, but I think there really is a sense of dig in, understand it. Every security vendor is clearly doing that at this point, as are all vendors. Um, but, but I think in our case, we're like, we're not going to just hand things over to the AI tools very rapidly. And I don't think that's going to hurt us competitively. Because mm -hmm. I think if a young startup were to come after us and say, we've done it all in AI, oh, they're going to get some of those unintended consequences and yeah. maybe find real issues real quick. Yeah. Right? So, well, absolutely. Right. Matt McLean, founder and CEO of SailPoint, thank you so much mm. for coming on theCUBE today and spending time with us. I knew it was going Pleasure. to be a great conversation. You did not disappoint. Thank great guest, Mark. Thank absolutely. you so much. Pleasure. Absolutely. Well, you guys, great questions, great conversation. Really enjoyed it absolutely. so much. Absolutely. And to our viewing audience, keep it right here on theCUBE. Continued coverage of RSA out of San Francisco. This is the place you want to be. <laughs>